Everywhere you look at the moment, establishment liberal values are cracking and crumbling in the face of what's become known as populism. Liberal democracies everywhere are being shaken to their foundations, by, in particular actually by constitutional crises. Places like uh, Poland, Brazil, Spain, Britain obviously, and the US. Uh, and these, are, these go beyond just the normal political crises and they get to the very foundations, the very roots of those nation states. On top of that, you've seen the rise of what's become known as illiberal democracy in a number of countries, Turkey, Hungary, uh, Russia, the Philippines could all fall into these, uh, this category. And that is a really, that's a fundamental threat to the established world order, the established world order over the last 25 years. And of course, then from another angle, we're witnessing uh, a trade war, a growing trade war, uh, and the threat of a, a, a much larger trade war um, between China and the US, growing support also, and this is from a different angle, for nationalizations in, uh, in Britain, in particular spearheaded by Corbyn. Now, both of those things, trade wars and, uh, and the idea of kind of larger scale nationalizations, they threaten from different ideological directions the liberal market upon which capitalism uh, rests. Now, for the establishment, this is obviously a disaster. They wail about it all the time in the press. And uh, this quote on the screen, which I'll come to in a moment, is from a very, very long, far too long, and extremely dry manifesto by The Economist magazine for, as it says at the bottom there, reinventing liberalism for the 21st century. They're, just, they're endlessly, the Financial Times, The Economist, endlessly is churning out uh, complaints about the, the crisis and decline of liberalism. For us, though, it, it shows something entirely different. It shows uh, a, a searching, uh, with, w and this has revolutionary implications, a searching for something different to the status quo, a way out, an alternative, something different to the, to the established order of the last period. Now, as Marxists, we are opposed to liberalism. It's the philosophy that underpins capitalism and imperialism. But we're also opposed to those reactionary right-wingers, like Donald Trump, for example, who try and profit off this crisis of liberalism. Our task, then, is to understand what liberalism is, where it's come from, and through that understand why it is in crisis today. When we do understand this, we'll be able to bury it once and for all, but from a, from a, a revolutionary socialist perspective, instead of from the perspective of right-wing demagogy. So where, where did liberalism come from? Well, liberalism, as I'm sure everybody here knows, is notoriously difficult to define. And you can see here, this is the economists' attempt to define it. This is at the very beginning of their manifesto for reinventing liberalism for the 21st century. And it's a mess. It doesn't really explain anything. It, it poses far more questions than it really answers. It talks, for example, it says, uh, you know, conflict, uh, you know, that society is a place of conflict, and that it will and should remain so in the right political environment. What's the right political environment? It doesn't explain what the right political environment uh, is. It, uh, it talks about society getting better, but that, I mean, that's a, that's a completely empty uh, phrase. What, is, what does that mean? It talks about a distrust of power. Well, obviously, it can't mean literally all power. If no one had the power to do anything, nothing would ever happen. It doesn't mean all power, but it doesn't say what kind of power it has a distrust of. And this phrase, uh, equal civic respect, uh, is also completely vacuous, completely empty. The economists, for those who read it, know that it's, it's the most... Preachy. It's the most annoying uh, magazine uh, and bourgeois publication when it comes to defending the ideas of liberalism. They're the biggest champions of it, and yet they, this is the best definition that they, can, uh, that they can offer of it. It really is completely <coughs> empty, completely hollow. And, uh, and, and its meaning also has changed, the idea of liberalism. Its meaning has changed over time uh, and from place to place. Obviously, you had early liberals like John Stuart Mill and people like Hayek, obviously, far later, also claim the title of liberalism. And, and the, 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 the title, liberal, the, the name liberalism, also would include, for example, someone like Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, who had a radically different approach to, to Hayek, and yet they would all fall under the same uh, banner, probably. In very general terms, I think, though, we can say that uh, liberalism, it makes its centerpiece the championing of the individual, free markets, universal suffrage, the rule of law, 
constitutional governments, limited government, this kind of, uh, this kind of thing. This is, broadly speaking, what liberalism is all about. Now, it arose, as I'm sure we realise, I'm sure we know, at the time of the bourgeois revolutions, as a, co as a more coherent ideology, it arose at the time of the bourgeois revolutions because it expressed very well the conditions of life of the bourgeoisie. It expressed their, uh, the way in which they lived, the way in which they approached and hoped to develop society. And uh, you can see then here a quote from Trotsky in, in, uh, in writing in In Defense of Marxism. He talks about what makes a particular political idea correct for any, any given period, any given moment. And he says it's, uh, it's, it's to the extent that it concentrates uh, the most progressive elements of a particular kind of uh, way of running society, a particular kind of economy. And so obviously liberalism was the correct, uh, the correct kind of politics for the bourgeois uh, at the time of the bourgeois revolutions. And that's because it was coming out of a, a, a situation, a world, uh, which I, and I don't have time to develop this in enormous detail. Of course, there was a discussion yesterday on the birth of capitalism, which comrades, if they weren't there, should watch the video of, uh, because that will deal with this, this particular point in a lot more detail. It's coming out of a, world, a kind of feudal world where we had serfs tied to the land, and it was, a, it was a system, it was a social system based on loyalty to one's feudal lord rather than individual freedom. And the whole point is that at a certain point, the economy within that feudal society had developed to such an extent that those social conditions, the society with the, and the social bonds which existed under, under feudalism, were hemming in, were, were, were preventing the further development of the economy. Uh, under those circumstances. They became a fetter, the social relations became a fetter on the further development of the economy. And it was the bourgeois class, the merchant class obviously, who wanted the ability to move freely from place to place. If you think, I mean, under, there weren't centralised states, for example in France, there were all sorts of different uh, regions, uh, Aquitaine and, and Brittany and, and others, that, that exhausts the limit of my uh, knowledge on, on different regions of France at that time. But uh, <coughs> But they, all, of these, uh, all of these kind of feudal uh, areas, they charged their own taxes. And it, it was very difficult, basically, for, for merchants, for the bourgeois class, to move around, uh, around the country to, to develop the, the economy across, across the whole region or across what we now know as the whole country. And so they wanted the ability to move freely from place to place, as few taxes as possible. They needed to know, for example, that the law wouldn't be changed arbitrarily that there was some system, some, some uh, constitution, if you like, that promised them that they would all have the say, that they would be treated in the same way no matter where they went. And it was all for the purposes, obviously, of developing the economy. A big part of this also explains like, the liberal preference for a smaller state. The smaller the state, the fewer the taxes, the freer the merchant class, the bourgeois class is to, uh, to move around. Obviously, in order to make that change in society, there had to be, it, well, that was a fundamental change to how the feudal system operated. You couldn't have that kind of, you couldn't live that kind of life. You couldn't achieve what the bourgeois wanted to achieve within the confines of, uh, of feudalism. So that had to be a fundamental change in society, a revolution. And it was the bourgeois class then who led those revolutions uh, to, uh, uh, and they did to, to, to fundamentally change society in this way. And they did so under the banner of liberalism, which was this philosophical framework that incorporated all of their different needs, free markets, constitutional and limited government, uh, and all the rest of it. But uh, it's an important point to understand that the bourgeois class could not have carried that revolution through by itself. They obviously were a very, for relatively small section of society. You had the masses in these, uh, in these societies, in France, in England, and so on. Um, masses made up, certainly in the earlier bourgeois revolutions, of a small layer of working class and a much larger layer of uh, kind of peasantry. And, and even the working class wasn't fully formed, or certainly wasn't fully conscious in the, in the earlier revolutions uh, in the way that the working class is today, for example. But uh, as I say, the, so the bourgeois class couldn't, uh, couldn't carry through the revolution by itself. It needed the masses to, uh, to do that as well. And so Engels explains this extremely well in a passage from uh, Socialism, Utopian, Scientific, which is this one here. He explains that, uh, well, you can see there, <coughs> side by side with the antagonisms of the feudal nobility and the burghers, who claim to represent the, the burghers being the bourgeois, 
who claimed to represent all the rest of society, was the general antagonism. And so on. And he says, is this very circumstance that made it possible for the representatives of the bourgeoisie to put themselves forward as representing not one special class, but the whole of suffering humanity? In other words, they built an alliance. The bourgeois led it, but they didn't, lead that, they didn't achieve that revolution entirely by themselves. It was an alliance of the bourgeois with the rest of society uh, in general, with the masses. And, uh, and especially the bits that I've highlighted there, the bits that I've underlined. From its origin, the bourgeois was saddled with its antithesis, in, in class terms, obviously. Capitalists can't exist without wage workers. <laughs> And uh, here again, although upon the whole the bourgeoisie in their struggle with the nobility could claim to represent at the same time the interests of the different working class of that period, yet in every great bourgeois movement there were independent outbursts of that class which was the forerunner more or less developed of the modern proletariat. Right? It was a unity of different... It's very important to understand that aspect of the bourgeois revolutions. And actually uh, this then moves on to the, to the next uh, bit I want to talk about which is this. The bourgeoisie, they, in leading these revolutions, they talked in, in, in terms of leading the masses, being the representatives of everybody against the, against the feudal class. But of course, it was very much that, although there was this unity between the different classes, it was led by the bourgeoisie, it was led by, by that particular class. We know, it, Engels says here, he says, for the first time appeared the kingdom of reason and so on. We know today that this kingdom of reason was nothing more than the idealized kingdom of the bourgeoisie. It was, uh, it was unity between all these different classes, but it was very much bourgeois-led. The bourgeois were in control of this, uh, of this revolutionary movement. And, and uh, <coughs> precisely for this reason, because the question arises then, if you're, if you're part of the bourgeois and you're in this situation where you need a revolution to fundamentally change how society works, the question arises, how do you get the masses on side? With what philosophy, with what ideas do you get the people who you are actually exploiting, the working class and the other masses, to side with you against these other group, this other layer in society who is also exploiting the masses. How do you get them to pick you, uh, your class, over their class? And, uh, and the conclusion that you come to, I think, is to, uh, is to give your philosophy and your ideas a very abstract character, actually a very empty character. Say, phrases like freedom of the individual, who can disagree with that? Liberty, equality, fraternity, the slogan of the French Revolution, who can disagree with that? Everyone, everybody can agree with that. Those things are, are empty phrases. They're, they're hollow. They can be filled, in fact, with whatever content uh, you like. They're so abstract as, uh, as, in fact, to be almost meaningless, uh, certainly when we think about them today. And filling, them with the, filling these kind of slogans within the bourgeois revolution with their own content is, of course, exactly what happened. We had a discussion this morning on the English Revolution, Oliver Cromwell and the English Revolution. And that's what you saw with the levellers and with the diggers in particular. They took those words literally, liberty, equality, fraternity, obviously that was the French Revolution, not the English. But that idea of, of equality between people, for the bourgeois, they thought of that as meaning equality for us with the, uh, you know, political, political rights for us, not just for the feudal aristocracy, basically. We all, the people with money also want the rights. But in order to get the masses on side with the bourgeois, they didn't say rights for the ri rights for the people with money. To get the masses on side, they said rights for everyone. Every, every man should have a right. Every individual should have the freedom, freedom of the individual, liberty, equality, fraternity, to get everybody on side with that. But, uh, but obviously the risk then, and this is exactly what happened, the risk is that the masses fill that with their own content. And they say, you talk about equality, let's have real equality. Let's not just have equality on paper, Let's have actual economic equality, not just political equality, for example. And that's why, I mean, the quote from, uh, from wherever it was, the, the bottom of this Engels quote here, um, <clears throat> that's why you see, uh, in it, as he says, in every great bourgeois movement, there were independent outbursts of that class which was the forerunner, more or less developed, of the modern proletariat. So although there's this, in the bourgeois revolutions, there was this unity between different layers of society, there was also that class tension that existed within that bourgeois right from the very beginning, right from the English Revolution, and of course in the French Revolution, and, uh, and later on. Now, uh, the reason for giving this explanation is because, as I said before, liberalism is very difficult to define. In fact, it can only be understood, you can't really give some abstract definition of it, it can only be understood in its philosophy, in its historical context. You can only understand it as it developed, and why it developed in this particular way.
why liberalism is the, the reason why liberalism is uh, is difficult to define is uh, well I'll come on to this but it's deliberate it's on purpose it's deliberately hard to define because it's designed to be abstract it's designed to unify different layers of society who are actually fundamentally uh, have fundamentally different interests we can say uh, then that liberalism is the philosophy of the bourgeoisie and it was primarily used uh, well at first primarily used as a weapon against the old feudal establishment now I've got an example of this which is here another bit by Engels it's actually, well it's an introduction to a pamphlet by Marx on the question of free trade now a big part obviously of the struggle of the of, of the bourgeois of the nascent bourgeois class was uh, was, was to put money above land, if you like, to put the interests of the bourgeois above the interests of the, the feudal aristocracy. And a big part of that in England uh, came a little bit later, like much later, in fact, than the English Revolution. There was a struggle over the question of the Corn Laws. And the Corn Laws were basically uh, laws which, uh, they were basically protectionist laws. They pushed up the price of, uh, of corn in Britain. They, they promised a certain, a certain price of cor for corn. Uh, for, for producers in Britain, which pushed up the price, obviously, of, uh, of labour in Britain, meant that it was much more expensive for the manufacturers to, uh, to employ people. And obviously, it benefited, a high price of corn benefited the landowners. So the Corn Laws benefited the landowners and disadvantaged the industrialists. And so there was this big movement uh, against the Corn Laws, basically, uh, which rallied, like it, was del it deliberately was designed to rally the, uh, the, the industrialists, the bourgeois class, and they got behind them the working class, the masses, and they said, look, these people are pushing the price of uh, corn up. Do you, want, do, you want cheaper, do you want cheaper corn? In that case, you should join the, it was another example, you should join the anti-corn law movement. It was another example of this unity between classes that actually have different interests against the kind of landowning, uh, against the landowning class. And, uh, and the slogan was, was free trade free markets, liberalism basically, freedom of the individual to do whatever they like. That was the banner under which the anti-corn law movement was, uh, was, was carried out. Right? And, uh, and, and the point of this quote is to show it was a weapon against the landed aristocracy. This is what Engels is saying. Free trade, liberalism, it's a weapon against the, against the, the old feudal uh, class. But, uh, <clears throat> oh, and, and okay, yeah, and, and ever since then, that has remained the case, right? Uh, the, the ideas of liberalism have remained a weapon in the hands of the ruling class. Uh, whatever the ruling class needs at any particular time, liberalism has been uh, moulded, massaged to fit that. And that's what, uh, that's what this next quote comes from. It's again from that same Economist article, actually. And you can see here that it talks about how liberalism has changed over, the, over a period of time, depending on the needs and the interests of the ruling class at any, at any particular time. Yes, it started off as this uh, anti-big anti state, in favour of a centralised state, but in favour of limiting it, and in favour of freedom of the individual, in favour of free trade and all the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> obviously today, it's considered quite different, universal suffrage and this sort of thing, but you can see that first paragraph. Mill and Badgett, some of the earlier uh, liberals, uh, they very much were not in favour of extending the franchise to the majority of people. They were in favour of property owners only having the vote, otherwise you just get chaos, you just get anarchy and so on. But of course, that, and they, they were opposed, obviously, to state education. They were opposed to relief efforts during the Irish famine. Uh, and yet liberalism has changed over a period of time. Um, it says here, after the Depression, the Second World War, we, that is the Economist magazine, we hewed to Keynesian views. And then later we subsequently rebelled against those to support deregulation and privatisation that Thatcher and Reagan uh, brought in. Right? They, they, liberalism is, is malleable to the interests of the ruling class. That's the point. It's not really a kind of overarching, uh, kind of written into the, into, the, into the fabric of society or the universe or anything else. It's, it's used to, to, to bolster the interests of the ruling class at any particular time. You saw that in its earliest days. It was used uh, by the bourgeois against the, the feudal aristocracy, against feudalism. And, uh, and you've seen it subsequently with them uh, chopping and changing depending on what their, their interests are. But as well as being, uh, like that's kind of just one side of liberalism. It's it, it, it expressing the needs of the ruling class at any particular time. It just being the philosophy that the ruling class uses to justify uh, capitalism, if you like. It's, uh, the other side of it is that it's a weapon against 
the masses, against the working class in particular. It's a weapon that deliberately is designed deliberately to obscure and confuse the program of the bourgeois class and to confuse the fact that it's the bourgeois class that, leads, that, led, this, uh, that led this revolution in the first place. Uh, you know, these bourgeois revolutions. And it's designed to obscure the fact that they do use this philosophy for their own role. It basically, it's the philosophy that justifies capitalism. But the other side of it is that it obscures the fact that it's the philosophy to justify capitalism. It doesn't say that openly. It doesn't say, yeah, liberalism is all about defending capitalism. It, uh, it actually hides that fact. And it's designed, in fact, to hide that fact. And that's how it consolidates the ruling class, the bourgeois class, in power. And this is particularly clear when it comes to questions of constitutionalism and of the state, for example. So it dresses, up, it dresses the state up in, in independence, basically. It dresses it up in wigs and gowns for the judiciary, for example, in pomp and ceremony with the opening of, of parliament and this kind of stuff. And, uh, and it's made to seem independent, which is entirely a fiction, as, as we know, a fiction intended to deceive the masses as to the real role of, uh, of the state. And, and it's, li it's, it's the ideas of liberalism that, that kind of encapsulate this, in, this, whole, this whole veil, this whole, uh, this whole uh, obscurity around this, around this question. In fact, of course, it's very clear to see that, st that state functionaries themselves, the state bureaucrats, are tied, in some cases literally tied, they are literally, uh, you know, for example, it's been revealed recently in the press how many MPs are also landowners, uh, also, you know, landlords and stuff. They are literally part of the same class as the ruling class in society. In other cases, just through generally similar class outlooks, right? They go to the same schools, they go to the same universities, they move in the same circles. They have a generally similar outlook. In that sense, the state is very much still today, always has been, tied entirely to the interests of, uh, of that class. And... Uh, <clears throat> In reality, then, like for all this talk of universal suffrage, the rule of law, democracy, that is, that's, you know, liberal, liberal democracy is, is what is always referred to. There's nothing, in fact, democratic about, uh, about the modern state, about the bourgeois state at all. All kinds of barriers stand in the way of genuine democratic participation by ordinary people in, uh, in the state, in the running of society. Um, <clears throat> I mean, just, for example, questions of time. In order, to, in order to genuinely participate in, in politics, you have to have some idea of what's going on. That requires time to read the news, to think about it, to discuss it with other people. But working class people don't have that kind of time. They have it less and less, of course, as the, as the crisis gets worse. But in general, people don't have that kind of time. They don't have the money necessarily to, uh, to, to uh, spend on, on books or magazine subscriptions or newspaper subscriptions to find out what's going on. And of course, even if they did, the press is owned by the ruling class. It's owned by the bourgeois class. So even if you did read the press, you wouldn't actually get the real news. You wouldn't actually get real analysis of society. All these things prevent genuine democratic control of the state by working class uh, people, by ordinary people. Bourgeois liberal democracy is formal. It's another, it's another It's formal and abstract. Just like liberty, equality, fraternity, it's there in name, but it's abstract. It's abstract from the real lives of real people. And all comrades, if you haven't already, and even if you have, have another look at it, should study uh, Lenin's State and Revolution, because there is loads of good stuff that explains exactly this. And it's just the same 100 years ago. Uh, it's just the same today as it was 100 years ago. And I've got some of the best uh, quotes here, which I can go through quickly, because I've just explained exactly what they, uh, what they say. Here he's talking about capitalist democracy being inevitably narrow and stealthily pushing aside the poor and being hypocritical and false through and through. But again, it's this formal, abstract uh, nature. It talks about democracy, talks about uh, everybody having all sorts of rights and all the rest of it. And in reality, it, it uses various methods to push those, uh, push those rights uh, to one side. And again, this democracy is always hemmed in by the narrow limits set by capitalist exploitation. Consequently, always remains, in effect, a democracy for the minority only for the property, <coughs> the property classes, only for the rich. Uh, so in that sense, nothing fundamental changes, obviously, between, uh, between feudalism and capitalism. It's still, it's still an exploiting class. It's still a ruling class that governs things. It's just they've managed to dress this up in, uh, in, in as I say, in wigs and gowns, in the language of liberalism, basically. This is what liberalism is. And yet, in reality, uh, nothing much has changed at all.
Uh, what have we got here? Yeah, here's another, here's another, here's another good example. Um, here he's talking specifically about the, the kind of things that I just spoke about, freedom of the press and, and the, the time that people have uh, and this kind of stuff. Here he's talking about that and he says, <coughs> in, some, in their sum total, these restrictions exclude and squeeze out the poor from politics, from active participation in uh, democracy. And, uh, and this is where he's talking about the corruption of officials, right? He's talking about how uh, <coughs> through direct or indirect corruption uh, of officials. Direct corruption in the sense that, the, and the long paragraph underneath explains that when, uh, when, and this happens all the time, when civil servants uh, leave whatever job they're doing, or when ministers leave whatever job they're doing, they immediately offer the job in the private sector. Often in cases like of civil servants, often <coughs> in the sector that they have previously been regulating as part of the government. There's this revolving door between the private sector and the public sector. Is that not direct corruption? Is that not actual bribery of, uh, of, of the, you know, do a good job while you're a politician, do a jo good job while you're a state functionary. And if you do that good job, we'll give you a, a well-paying six-figure salary um, <coughs> In, uh, once you finish kind of thing. That is the direct corruption of officials. And then there's the indirect corruption of officials. Obviously states take on a lot of debt and, uh, and, and therefore like the, the health of a, a particular state <coughs> is governed by the stock exchange. It's governed by financiers. And, uh, and, and this, you know, if you, don't do what the, if you don't do what the markets want basically, you won't be able to borrow any more money. Your debts will be called in. The state will be bankrupted. It won't be able to operate. You only need to look at Venezuela for examples of this. Is that not the indirect corruption? Do as we say, or we're gonna, or, or, or we'll ruin you. Basically, is that not the indirect corruption of officials? Right. In, <coughs> excuse me. In a thousand and one ways, the uh, the the state is tied to uh, is is tied to the ruling class, and this fiction, this this veil of of liberalism, of democracy. Is, is just that, entirely a, a fiction. And uh, it's also a particularly important feature, and this is where, this is where the liberal state, the liberal democracy is different to feudalism. And this is an important feature to understand, in my opinion. But no longer is this, does the state power under, under liberal democracy, under capitalism, no longer does state power rest with kind of one individual or one family. It instead rests with a... a, 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 a um, a system is constructed, a state is constructed within which individuals and parties and all sorts can just cycle through. You can elect who you like, but they, just, they can cycle in and out. You can have a scandal, you can have one particular individual, one particular party fall from power. It makes no fundamental difference to the state structure itself and certainly not the underlying, uh, the underlying system that exists. And, uh, and that's a real conquest of liberalism. That's a real conquest of, uh, of, of the bourgeois revolutions. To be able, it, it makes the it makes the liberal it makes the state a lot healthier basically as a shell within which capitalism can operate. This is exactly what Lenin says in uh, in State and Revolution. He explains it much better than I could. And he says a democratic republic is the best possible shell for capitalism because it establishes its power so securely, so firmly that no change of persons, institutions, or parties in the bourgeois democratic republic can shake it. You establish a system where you, people feel like they have a vote. They feel like they have a choice. They feel like they're influencing things. It's not like feudalism where you just did as you were told. You've got, you've got your opportunity to express yourself. We've got a, a free press and all the rest of it. But it doesn't matter. You can have whatever newspapers you like. They can rise and fall. Political parties can rise and fall. But fundamentally, the system remains intact. Precisely because of what I just explained about the state being tied by a thousand threads to the interests of the ruling class. Now, uh, <clears throat> at the time of the, uh, of the French and, and English revolutions, the earlier bourgeois revolutions, the working class existed to a certain extent. It was less clearly defined than it is certainly today, and then even that it was even 100 years after that, or, or 50 years even after that. And it certainly was less conscious of its, uh, of its position, uh, you know, it was less class conscious, if you like, it was co less conscious of its position within society. And so liberalism, to a certain extent, this, uh, this, this, this fiction that it created, uh, as, 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 you know, the fiction that the bourgeois created with the ideas of liberalism as a means of unifying the classes, was effective at blunting the class struggle to a certain extent. Not entirely, obviously, there were 
you know, the, the levelers and the diggers and this kind of thing. People did start to see through that, that fiction. But to a certain extent, earlier on, when the working class was less firmly developed, less class conscious, it, uh, it, 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 it was more or less effective at blunting the class struggle. <coughs> Already by 1848, when uh, you know, the bourgeois revolution still needed to, you know, were still required to resolve uh, contradictions that existed in a number of countries. 1848 was a period when revolution was sweeping Europe. Already by then, the working class was beginning to see, it was a bit more fully formed, a bit more class conscious. It was beginning to see through this fiction that, uh, that was being created, this fiction of liberalism. Uh, this attempt to obscure the different class interests of the bourgeoisie and the working class. And that Engels wrote a series of articles um, called Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Germany, all about the 1848 revolutions in Germany. And, uh, and this is what he says, it's the fate of all revolutions that this union of different classes, which in some degree is always the necessary condition of any, rev oh, of any revolution, cannot subsist long. And the quote goes on to explain that at a certain point, once certain basic uh, achievements have, have been realized, that's when the classes turn their weapons on each other and this union uh, begins to break down. Of course, that can only happen. That happened in 1848 in Germany to a greater extent than it happened in France or England because the working class was a little bit more developed at that time. This gives us the clue. This gives us the, the beginnings <coughs> excuse me, of the explanation for why liberalism is in crisis today. Now, <clears throat> that liberalism is in crisis isn't really up for dispute. I, haven't, I didn't intend, and clearly I'm not going to just explain in what ways it is in crisis in every country around the world, because <coughs> I imagine you're all fairly aware of that. But it's worth pointing out that these, this is not a usual crisis, what we're seeing uh, around the world. I mean, what we're seeing not, is the political crises are not just the usual scandals or, or, or whatever, um, <coughs> or, or mistakes of particular individuals or particular parties. Because, as I've explained, liberalism is structured to be able to deal with that sort of thing. Someone messes up, you remove them, you put someone else in, doesn't make a fundamental uh, difference. Now, the political crises we see today are constitutional crises, much more fundamental, not about this or that individual, but they threaten the very fabric of the nation states that were established by the bourgeois revolutions in the first place, like uh, the question of independence in Scotland, like the question of uh, Catalonia, for example. The question of Brexit obviously has a big impact on, on the Irish question, uh, which is also a, a constitutional question. And then you also see, uh, see other countries where the crisis, again, is more fundamental than a normal political crisis. Take, take Brazil or the US or Poland, where the judiciary has become a political battleground in, in one way or another. Now, that's not supposed to happen. The state, as, as I've explained, is tied by a thousand threads to the board. You've got the, the front-facing bit, the, the pretty face of the state, which is you vote once every five years, and that's some, some sort of democracy. That's some sort of choice that people have. But there's a vast apparatus behind those people, the civil servants, the judges, the army. None of that is elected, obviously, the prison system. None of that's elected. That all just fun continues to function as normal. And the whole point is that happens in the shadows. That happens in the background. The politicians pretend like they're going to make a difference, and in reality, they don't make any kind of difference at all. But the fact that in these countries, in the US and Brazil and Poland, the judiciary is being dragged, kicking and screaming into the spotlight in, and being made a political issue is a much more fundamental crisis for the, the bourgeois, like democrat, liberal democratic uh, state. Um, and then you, the other, another aspect showing that this crisis that we see, to, this crisis of liberalism we see today is, is that. It's not just a political crisis, it is a crisis of, liberal, no. it is a crisis of liberalism is that we've got a situation in a number of places where the political representatives of the ruling class no longer actually reflect that class's interests uh, properly. And Brexit is the most obvious example of that, where the ruling class in Britain don't want Brexit, the big bourgeois in Britain don't want Brexit, and yet it's the Tory party, their representatives, who have, it, who have, have created the, the Brexit crisis. <clears throat> Obviously in the US, the big bourgeois wanted Clinton, Clinton to win the election, and yet Donald Trump, as a Republican, someone who is part, you know, part of a bourgeois party, just like Clinton is, but he's, he's supposed to represent their interests as well. And yet he, uh, you know, they're very worried about his, uh, his behavior. And you see it on an international level as well. Trade wars are not in the interest of the international ruling class, and yet they're happening anyway, thanks to their own representatives. 
The point is that this isn't a normal crisis. The bourgeois doesn't really have much of a, an idea about its future. It's, it's, one, it's, it's reached a real dead end uh, in terms of the further development of society. It's not a normal crisis. It's very much a crisis of, of the ideology to which it gave birth. The, the, it's, it is very much the crisis of liberalism. And this is because liberalism as a, as a philosophy, as a way of structuring society, of course, as I explained earlier, it bases itself on individualism. It talks about the individual all the time. And yet that is in direct contradiction to the economic system which gave birth to it. Because the capitalist system doesn't function in an individualistic way for the vast majority of people. That's the point. In fact, the, the capitalist system relies on two, as it's, as it's put in the Communist Manifesto, it relies on two giant camps that exist in society, two great camps. The bourgeoisie and the proletariat classes. It relies on a contradiction between classes. Not individuals, but two big uh, groups of people within society. And, uh, and for one of those classes, of course, on top of that, for the vast majority of people under capitalism, the conditions of existence are not individualistic. They're socialistic. Production is socialised. That's how capitalism develops the economy. It socialises production. Right, it's, it's, it's entirely in contradiction to, to the ideas to which it gave birth in the form of liberalism. It's entirely in contradiction to individualism. And at different points in, in time and, and space, the class contradictions upon which capitalism is based obviously become sharper and, and less clear depending on the, the ebb and flow of the class struggle. Sometimes it's very clear to people that there's class contradictions in society. Some sometimes it's not so much. It's in a period of crisis, like the period we're in now, that the class contradictions come into very sharp relief. These class contradictions really come to the surface. When that happens, it becomes very clear immediately that individual freedom is entirely subordinate, uh, subordinate to and dictated by your position in relation to the means of production, to your class, in other words. Not in, not in its detail, obviously, but in the broad outlines, that is, uh, that's, that's what a crisis brings to the surface, basically. That, the indiv that your individual freedom is not really your own. It's dictated by your class position in society. That's what people begin to realise. And when, uh, basically under those circumstances, that's when the fundamental ideas that underpin liberalism begin to crumble. It becomes obvious that the rich aren't just rich because they work harder, but because of their class position. It becomes clear that universal suffrage doesn't really make any difference at all because the people who really control things, you vote in whatever government you like, you're still going to get austerity. Universal suffrage actually makes no difference. That becomes clear in a period of crisis. The rule of law and, and laws and the legal system in general becomes seen not as something to protect people, to defend their rights and so on, but as something that only protects the rights of, uh, of the ruling class. There's no, you see it looking around London today, there's no human right to a house, clearly, because there's so many homeless people, and yet uh, there's human rights to private property and this kind of thing. And that becomes very clear in a period of, uh, of crisis. When class contradictions in society rise to the surface, when the class struggle starts to heat up, the hollowness of, uh, of liberalism becomes clear for everybody to see. Liberalism cannot survive uh, a crisis of that kind. It cannot survive the polarisation of society, basically. And that is why it's in crisis today. And, uh, and there's all sorts of historical examples of that exact same thing happening. And I've got a great... This is fantastic. You should all read um, Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution very long, but I dug out this particular quote. It's about the constituent assembly, right? In other words, a kind of bourgeois democratic uh, demand, a liberal demand. And he, uh, he's explaining that almost unnoticeably in the course of the events of the revolution, this chief democratic slogan, which had for a decade and a half tinged with its colour the heroic struggle of the masses, had grown pale and faded out, had somehow been ground between, mil between millstones, had become an empty shell a form naked of content, a tradition, and not a prospect. That's what happens to liberalism in a period where class struggle rises to the surface. The two, the, the two great classes, the two great camps that exist in society, they just, like two millstones, grind to dust the hollow, empty nothingness of these liberal slogans uh, which, uh, which have existed um, up until that point. Um, yeah. Now, of course... <clears throat> This isn't a conscious process. The fundamental uh, contradictions in society cause a lot of people to question things, but they don't immediately realise why this is taking place. Most people don't think necessarily immediately in, in the clear class terms that Marxists think in. 
And, uh, and that questioning that obviously comes, uh, comes about because of the conditions of crisis becomes a lashing out. And that isn't necessarily, as I say, on the, on the basis of a class understanding of society. And it's precisely because this process is unconscious that the right wing is able to hijack it. It's able to tap into, um, <clears throat> it's able to tap into a kind of collective identity, but divert it away from class struggle. It's able to talk about nationalism uh, and racism and this kind of stuff. Divert it away from uh, class struggle. Uh, they're able to blame one part of society and mobilise um, everyone against it, just like just exactly what like, like uh, Donald Trump is doing in this sort of thing. And that pits them, of course, against the liberal establishment. The liberal establishment want to retain that best political shell for capitalism. They, want to, they, they realise the value of liberal democracy from the point of view of preserving capitalism, so they try and preserve it. But, uh, but these, these, right -wing, these right wingers, these demagogues, tap into that, 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 the crisis, basically, the fact that people are beginning to see through this best political shell, they're beginning to, to draw potentially more radical conclusions. They tap into that and divert it off in an opposite direction and talk about other groups within society other than uh, class. And the result is you get illiberal governments and this kind of stuff. <laughs> yes, I've said all of that. Now, in a certain sense, then, you can say that there are these, uh, these right-wingers, these reactionaries like Trump, are a more accurate reflection in some ways. There's certainly a, a, a less varnished reflection of the bourgeois class in the crisis of capitalism. As I said earlier, liberalism cannot survive this kind of polarisation of society. These people, the Donald Trumps of the world, they're not a kind of aberration. They are the genuine reflection, the unvarnished reflection of what the ruling class needs to do in a, in a situation like this. I mean, it's too far to say, to describe Donald Trump as far-sighted. He's clearly not, um, particularly. But he has he's, he's, he's better opportunities. He's realised the mood that exists inside. He's realised what we realise, which is that liberalism is in crisis. And he has tapped into that, that mood that exists. In a certain sense, these right-wing uh, representatives of the capitalist system, like Trump, they, they show themselves more prepared to do what is required to preserve the capitalist system in a period of crisis. And that's exactly what's happened in the past as well. Again, this is from uh, Engels on the 1848 revolutions in Germany. He talks about restrictions of suffrage, the liberty of the press, the right to sit on juries, restricting all these democratic rights as soon as, he says, as against the victorious working man, although he had not yet uttered any specific demands, the friends and the foes of many years united, and the alliance between the bourgeoisie and the supporters of the overturn system was concluded upon the very barricades of Berlin. When, when threatened with, uh, with class struggle, serious class struggle, serious revolution, the bourgeois, the serious representative of the bourgeois, won't hesitate to just jettison all this liberal nonsense. The veil will be completely lifted. They'll leave all of that to one side and they will go back to restrictions on suffrage, the liberty of the press and everything else. Uh, they, uh, they real, that, that's what's required, basically, to keep capitalism uh, in power under circumstances of crisis. Again, liberalism cannot survive uh, the polarisation in society created by the crisis of capitalism. Against that, against the, more, the slightly more far-sighted, the more realistic, the people who are the representatives of the ruling class who are prepared to do what's required, you get people like The Economist magazine, uh, the Liberal Democrats, who just throw tantrums, basically, and, and complain about liberalism uh, not still being accepted by, uh, by everyone. These people are, are the, are the, are the backward-looking, they're the less developed elements of the ruling class, if you like, the, less, the ones less able to see what, how society is, the perspectives of the development of the crisis. They appear very pathetic and very impotent. I've got a couple of quotes from the Financial Times, two different uh, authors, both of which say a lot of very sensible things most of the time. But you can see this from Martin Wolf, who is very good on economics, but this is just uh, ridiculous. Um, it's completely impotent. He, took, he says, oh, we need a... And the whole article is, is dreadful, by the way. I couldn't put the whole thing in. But the whole article is just, oh, maybe we need a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and maybe just a tweak here and a tweak there, and maybe, it'll be, maybe we just need to go a little bit more back to Keynesianism and a little... Which, of course, Keynesianism being a complete aberration, complete exception. Liberalism, in general, is in favour of a smaller state because it's in favour of, of freer markets and capital moving and all the rest of it. But this, this, this whole thing reflects that general, oh, maybe a little bit this, a little bit that. That's, that's as much as he proposes. And then he says, is that even conceivable? 
Can we even conceive of a tiny little tweak here and there? That's the best that, uh, that these people can come up with. It's completely impotent. And the next, uh, the next one is a much better article, actually, from, uh, from Wolfgang Munchell on the same question on the crisis of liberalism. He points out, he says, if you really care about this stuff, he says, it's not, the whole article actually, he says elsewhere in the article, he says, look, Brexit and Trump, it's not, that's not the Russians' fault. It's not the Russians who have done this to us. We've done this to ourselves. This is our fault. And you can see, our problem is not the other team, but our team. He, he actually, he's one of the few in, in The Economist and the Financial Times who recognises we're messing this up. It's, it's the defenders of the existing... He doesn't have an answer. That's the, end, that's the last paragraph of the article. He doesn't have an answer to it. All, at this stage, all he can do is argue against people like Martin Wolf. We're the problem. They're still arguing over whose fault it is, basically, over what the problem actually is and where it comes from. Um, but uh, it shows you the impotence, basically, of the modern defenders of liberalism. They don't really have a solution. They don't have a way forward. It shows the dead end that the ruling class is facing. And, uh, and you see that again... Um, I don't have, I'm running a bit short on time, uh, but these two quotes, 13 and 14, uh, show the same thing. Um, this 13 one, Engels is talking about like the, uh, the, the indecision, weakness and cowardice of the democratic leaders. Again, like he's, he's describing their complete uselessness, their complete impotence, their inability uh, in the face of a revolution, a situation of revolution and counter-revolution in Germany, the democratic leaders, the liberals, they just they they have nothing to offer. They have nothing to contribute. And uh, and again, number fourteen. This is from Lenin. This is particularly good. Look at the second bit that I've underlined. When a liberal is abused, he says, "Thank God they didn't beat me." When he's beaten, he says, "Thank God they didn't kill me." Oh, to kill him. When he's killed, he will thank God that his immortal soul has been delivered from his mortal clay. In other words, they have literally nothing to say when it's all kicking off around them. All they can say is, "Oh well, it could be worse." Which is obviously no, that's no programme, that's no perspective for the, for the future. And yet that's the best that they can offer. Um, <clears throat> now the point, is, uh, especially of the, that Lenin's talking here about the Russian Revolution, Engels in the previous one is talking about revolution and counter-revolution in Germany in 1848. The point of these historical examples that we should uh, derive from this is also, it's not just bad decisions that have led liberalism to where it is today, which is how The Economist tries to paint it. It's not just that the liberal leaders have made a few mistakes and all that's required is, is some sensible liberal leaders to get things back on track. It's part of the historical process. It's part of the, the process of crisis and the rise of class struggle. So what should we do with all of this? Well, look, these quotes, certainly, 13 and 14, demonstrate that we absolutely mustn't ally ourselves with the liberals. The whole point is they are being ground between two millstones. That's the perspective for the future. We just had in this room a discussion on, uh, on, on economics, on the economic. That crisis isn't going away. It's only going to get worse. Liberalism is going to be ground between two millstones. We want nothing to do with it. We don't ally ourselves with it. We certainly do any, don't do any kind of lesser evilism. Oh, well, is it, you know, a bit better. Clinton's a bit better than Trump. The liberals are a bit better than the conservatives. Uh, none, none of that. Um, <clears throat> basically, just as liberalism expressed very well the conditions of life of the bourgeoisie, because they were the re revolutionary class, they were the ones who were capable of developing society and the economy further, our political ideas and philosophy must express our conditions of life very well, because it's our class, the working class, that is capable of developing the economy further, and in the form of a socialised economy, just like our socialised conditions of existence at the moment. It's just at the moment there's a big barrier in the way, which is the private uh, appropriation of, of, of things that we produce in a social manner. So our philosophy and our ideas have to be the history and the theory of the struggle of the working class, and that, of course, uh, is Marxism. Going back to that Trotsky quote earlier, the correct political ideas today, the ones that really express progressive tendencies of development, are Marxist ideas and only Marxist ideas. Now we obviously have that understanding and we have to take that understanding to make conscious what is kind of semi-conscious or unconscious in the minds of other people. People are beginning to see this. Liberalism exposes itself just like capitalism takes itself into crisis. We have to illuminate that process of questioning, that process of lashing out against liberalism. So that instead of being this kind of unconscious, blind lashing out, latching onto anyone who promises any kind of solution based on a, on a you know, questions, based on an anti-liberal approach, um, and therefore can easily divert these things, we have to make it conscious and directed, of course, against the real enemy in society. And we have to use, and actually Lenin talks about this in this quote, use the fact, just like the levelers and the diggers did, right, use the fact that they talk about democracy. Or we say, well, yeah, let's have actual real democracy. Use their own words against them. Fill their empty abstractions with our content. 
as the stepping stone towards proving to people that you know, it's revolutionary socialist ideas that are the way forward instead of, uh, instead of liberal ones. Our job primarily is to bring this question of the class struggle out consciously into the open. That is what is creating the crisis of liberalism. It's the clash of classes caused by the crisis of capitalism. And we have to make that clear. We have to make that conscious in people's minds. Right? In uh, one of the most, I'm sure you've all read it, one of the most basic uh, texts, one of the, a classic by Lenin, Three Sources and Component Parts. This is what he says. People have always been the foolish victims of deception and self-deception in politics. And they always will be until they have learnt to seek out the interests of some class or other behind all moral, religious, political and social phrases, declarations and promises. Right, that's our job. Bring out the class content. It's not the immigrants' fault. It's not the Muslims' fault uh, that things are going badly wrong. We bring out the class content in things and direct the, uh, the anger that exists against liberalism into the correct uh, channels. Now, uh, yeah, basically, uh, I'll just finish with this. Look, liberalism is in crisis, uh, and to that I say good. It's lifting, it's lifting the veil. It's, it's showing the naked class struggle more and more to, to ordinary people. Well, it certainly has the potential to do that. We have the potential to do that. What it really means is that the gloves are coming off. There's no frills, no bells and whistles anymore in society. The gloves are coming off, and we're preparing... It's in preparation for a a bare-knuckle fight between uh, the working class and the ruling class. And we're ready for that fight. We've got the ideas. We understand. We can see that that is coming. And our job is to get that understanding, get our ideas, revolutionary ideas, Marxist ideas, to our class by intervening in the class struggle as it exists at the moment so that we can deliver a, a, a knockout blow to capitalism uh, and deliver a victory for, for the socialist revolution.